Good morning, guys. We're going to dive right into the Word today. I, I, if you've come to church here, you know that sometimes, most times, we open with worship that leads into the Word, but sometimes when you get a text from the Word, the Word leads to worship. And so that's what we're going to do today, and I'm really excited to open up God's Word. I found that as a pastor, sometimes, well, a lot of times, you should really be careful what you say in public, but also like to your family. Before I was a pastor, I was a pastor's kid, and I remember a couple of times my dad as a pastor saying some things that caused, let's just say, some interesting reactions in the house. One of the things that dad said, this was about the time I was 11, 12 years old, I have an older brother, Eric, who's two years older than me, and a younger sister, Chris, who's four years younger. And one time, we had a family friend, Tiffany, that was going to get married, and so dad said... I'm leaving to go marry Tiffany. I'll be back in a few hours. <laughs> Announced it to the family. And my brother and I, like, we understood what that meant. We just kind of went on with things. But I noticed my sister, like, was kind of working herself into a frenzy. And she was crying. And she came up and said, how are you guys okay with this? Did you all know this? How, what does mom think about this? And we're like, Krista, what are you talking about? And she said, Dad just said he's going to marry Tiffany. I didn't know there was problems. And we said, oh, you thought Dad meant he was going to be the groom, not the officiant. And so we explained it to her. A little while around that time, too, my dad had just had the talk with me, which is something that as parents we should do with our kids, right? And there's something about my dad that you need to know, like, truthfully, he has this unique ability to pray for couples who are infertile and, and help them through prayer and obviously through God's miraculous touch to have a child. Literally, he has prayed for a, more than a couple hundred families that have seen, after years of infertility, the great blessing of having a child. Dad has prayed for his church family. He's went all the way to Africa and prayed for families. He's flown to friends around the country that are having issues. He's even prayed for a family in this church that had not had a child that now has had a beautiful child that we've been able to baptize here at the cross. And so dad's kind of known as baby whisperer in the uh, Lutheran church world, let's say. And, and so, again, right after he had the talk with me and I kind of understood for the first time how things worked, he said that he was going to pray for Jill, or actually, no, he didn't say that. He, was, he said, I'm going to help Jill conceive a baby, <laughs> and then left the house. And I was like, well, Dad, that's not what you and I just talked about. <laughs> Is that above reproach? Which only pastor's kid at that age even know that, what that phrase means. And of course, I know what he was doing, and we know what he was doing now, but you just kind of have to be careful but dad has often wondered why, of all things, he has this particular unique healing gift. God works in mysterious ways, yes? And God uses people, and he brings healing still in our lives today. And that's really where I want to focus today, is on that healing aspect of God. We have a vision of preaching, teaching, and healing. And so healing is an important part of the ministry here at the church. But the most important part of healing is God showing up. And as I started thinking a little bit more about our chapter here, this amazing 11-year chapter at the cross that we've experienced, I started thinking, man, I've only got two messages left. I counted up, I didn't really, but I estimated that I've preached 400 different sermons, over 1,000 different services. That's not even counting like the longest sermon of all time, which was like 50 in one. And, and, and I was like, man, I've only got two chances left. And I felt like this pressure of better be good. They're expecting a lot out of you. And then I started thinking, honestly, God, do you know what would really just work? <laughs> Is if you just showed up. If you just showed up and did your thing and worked miracles and signs and wonders. Like if you just killed somebody right now and brought them back to life at the end of the service, we'd probably have like eight more people next Sunday. <laughs> right? I mean, if everyone's cancer just disappeared, we'd, we'd have like 14 more people. If we got to see an amputee just have a limb out of nowhere, that'd be like 24 new people next Sunday. God, if you just show up and do your thing, that's all we need in this world is for God to show up. And that's what I want to preach on today is God showing up. 
Our God is not dead, he's alive. And we can't always predict how and when and where, and oftentimes he shows up in different ways than we want and shows up in ways in which we need. But he still shows up. And as we're looking at the key ingredients of a Christian life and a key ingredients of the Christian church, there's nothing more important than simply God's presence in our life today. Today we're going to camp out in Mark chapter 5. It's an incredible story where Jesus has said yes to a challenge of raising a dying 12-year-old girl back to life. And as he's on this journey to go heal and bring her back to life, he is all of a sudden interrupted by a woman who has been bleeding for 12 years. And I want to dive deeper into this story. And if we dive into the context, like we're only five chapters into Mark, and I'm just kind of amazed at all that Jesus had on his plate. Like everywhere he went, people and crowds were demanding of him, and they showed up. By the way, when Jesus shows up, crowds show up. Did you know that? You want a crowd, just have Jesus show up. Everywhere he goes, people are demanding things and asking things. Like he's constantly on. And I wonder, like, how did you do it all, Jesus? How did you do it all? Because sometimes it feels like I got a lot going on. And I know I don't always give attention to the thing that most needs attention. Even as I was writing this paragraph, I got a notification text from my cousin who was enjoying Taco Bell nacho fries in that moment. That took me out of this writing. And then right after that, there was an email that came in that deleted. And then right after that, I saw that the Cleveland Browns signed Jadavian Clowney, former number one draft pick on that one edge, pairing with Miles Garrett, former number one draft pick on the other edge, to form what some articles are saying is the Super Bowl favorite for 2021-22. I mean, this text is about miracles still happening, right? And so how do we, in a chaotic world, handle everything? An answer for a lot of us is we just got to be better multitasking, Tackling multiple activities at the same time, that's the only way. How many of you, I've asked before years ago, how many of you think you're like effective, you're a good multitasker? How many of you would say you're a good multi? Come on, raise your hand if you think you're a good multitasker. It's not a trick question, it's just a simple question. Okay, you know, maybe 30% of the room thinks they're pretty good. Did you know that science tells us that only 2% of us have this genetic gift? Did you know that? 2%, so that's one out of like 50, and I'm one of them, so that means maybe three, four more in the room. <laughs> Only a few of us here, and most of us, what, what happens is when we attempt to do two things at the same time is we just keep diverting our brain attention back and forth that, that we actually, if we ever accomplish the two things, it actually takes longer and it's less quality by the time it's done. And this may or may not depend, uh, uh, this may or may not surprise you, but depending on your perspective, research has shown that women are in fact better at multitasking than men. I've said a lot of good things. And that's what you're going to hoot and holler about? Make this a gender thing? That's... Jesus, show up today and help us understand what's most important. Also, this, this was interesting. I just have to say this too. Research says that people who think they're the best at multitasking are, in fact, actually the worst. <laughs> so the ones who didn't, didn't raise your hand, like, you're probably the multitaskers in the room. And I don't know what that means for me. You say, Zach, why are you talking about this? Because, again, we're looking at a Jesus five chapters in that has just calmed the storm. Then he went and exercised some demons, and he's traveling to a new region, and he takes on an opportunity from a centurion to raise this centurion's 12-year-old dying girl back to life. In the middle of this life and death, literal matter that Jesus is embarking upon, he is stopped in his tracks. And we enter the story in Mark 5, 24. It says, as the uh, large crowd followed and pressed around him, and the Greek is like a violent pressing, in our day today, that means this crowd is absolutely not social distancing. They're right there, all around. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She'd suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she'd grown worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. This story, I think, is mentioned in all four Gospels, and we know from the other Gospels, she touched the edge of Jesus' cloak, the hem of his garment. Because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, or just touch the edge of his clothes, I will be healed. And look at what happens. 
Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. So this woman is literally at the end. She's had it. She spent 12 long years, went from doctor to doctor. The text says she'd financially spent everything she's had to try to fix this and has grown worse. Medicine and doctors are not cheap today. They were not cheap back then either. And she had literally spent everything in hopes to be cured. And she's tried it all, everything. And it's not bad to try things that doctors tell you, but she has already at this point gone natural. She's taken herbs. She's drunk the juices. She changed her diet. She diffused oil in every single room and nook and cranny in the house. When that didn't work, she became a vegan. Then she went through ketosis. Then she only ate kale for a month. When Orange Theory Fitness showed up in her town, she joined. And when that didn't work, she bought a Peloton. As humans, we so often try to fix what's wrong with worldly solutions. And this woman has done the same. And I'm not saying those avenues are wrong. In fact, some of the ways God heals today is through medicine and doctors and diet. And so the message today is not abandon anything and everything of this world and medicine and doctors are evil. No, maybe ketosis is the right thing for you. Maybe you should get on your Peloton a couple more times a week. I don't know. But I'm saying if all you're doing is these physical things, are you ensuring that Jesus is a part of your healing process? Because in our pursuit to be healed, Jesus is not our last resort. He is our first response. And so some of us have been there and we've dealt with a prolonged illness or stubborn medical condition and it's frustrating and it's even embarrassing to keep going to the doctor only returning home with an expensive prescription yet little hope. And sometimes I've found it's more frustrating and more humiliating to keep going and not knowing what it is than to even hear it's a bad diagnosis but at least I know what it is. At least I can work towards it. Scholars say that this woman took a 30-mile walk to see Jesus that day. You get the feeling like in those 60,000 steps to see Jesus, she knew that she would be healed. In fact, it's what she was thinking. If I can just touch his cloak, the edge of his cloak, that's a great faith statement that this woman is bringing to Jesus. And it's more than coincidence. I've talked about this before, where she touches the edge of Jesus' cloak, and it's intentional, and I'll tell you why. Because in the Hebrew Scripture, one important Jewish concept that we miss in our English translation is concerning where she touches the edge of the cloak of Jesus. The text, again, indicates it's the hem of the garment. And this is important because there's a prophecy in Malachi 4, verse 2. that says, but for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. Now you know that Jesus is that Son of Righteousness that Malachi is prophesying about. And Jesus would have healing attached with Him wherever He went. But what's amazing is that wings in Hebrew are the same word as the tassels or the hem or the edge of a garment. And so this was a deliberate act of faith on this woman's part. She believed Jesus was the son of righteousness. She believed in the Old Testament and she knew the prophecy and she had tried and she had spent everything. And at the end, she was left with nothing but Jesus. But friends, I have good news for you. When you have tried everything in this world and you are only left with Jesus, you have plenty. You have more than enough. She was desperate. And in her desperation, she reached for the edge, the rope of Jesus' garment. And immediately she was healed. This is the healing power of God. This is the power that's still available. And this is typically how we preach this sermon and read this story, when we think about healing. But I want to go deeper, because I think there's actually something far deeper and far more beautiful for us to see in this text. Again, we tend to think of it medically and physically, and clearly it was a serious issue back then with their lack of medical advancement and doctors. This issue could have been life-threatening for this woman, but I want to look at this story from a perspective of not only what Jesus did on the outside, but especially what he did to this inside of this woman. 
Because in the Mosaic or Jewish, Jewish law, you need to understand that if you were a woman and it was that time of the month for you, you were considered ritually unclean. And there's a list of things that you could not do as a woman when you were unclean. You were not allowed to have relations with your husband during that time. You could not go to worship God in the temple or the synagogue at that time. And you could not be in the presence of a rabbi, a priest, a holy man, a teacher of the law. Because the idea is that if you are unclean and you go to a person or place that is clean, you will then contaminate it. Here's the other reality, though. Not only should you not be around them, they wouldn't want you to be near them. Because it's a rigorous process once you become unclean to get clean again. It's not like jump in the shower for five minutes and you're good. There's a list of things. Now, for most women, of course, this was only a certain time every month, and the rest of the time you were clean and could do the things that everyone else can do. But think about this woman. This has not been a once a month issue for her. This has been 12 long years, a state of being unclean. If she was married, she'd had no relations, and I would say at that point had no even relationship with her husband. She couldn't go to church or worship for 12 years. Some of us had to go months or even about a year of experiencing that, and thank God we have online right now. Hello, online, by the way. They didn't even have that, and so she couldn't worship God or be in the house of God in that moment, and no one is or would want to be around her because she's unclean. Can you imagine what that would do to your sense of value for 12 long years to hear, you're unclean, and I don't want to be, and nobody wants to be around you. You are used up, you are dirty, you are you are no longer welcome here. Not only is it amazing to see Jesus physically heal her, but I believe that what this woman needs more than a physical touch is a mental, emotional, relational, psychological, inside touch. Building up value and restoring identity in a woman who had been crushed for 12 years. And so imagine you're here. You are her. And you hear about this Jesus that heals people. Because that's what happens, by the way. When Jesus heals people, people share. And people hear about it, and that's where crowds start coming when Jesus shows up. And, and so you hear about this Jesus, and he's got healing power, and he's the one healing in his wings, healing in his wings. And you hear about him, but here's the problem. You're going to run into the same problem that you've run into for 12 years now. Jesus is a rabbi, a priest, a holy man, and not only that, he's got a big mission to accomplish, and he can't afford to be unclean right now. 12 years, you think she started to buy the hype? But she's so desperate, she thinks of a plan. Well, maybe, maybe in the midst of a violently pressing crowd, I'll just kind of sneak up, not make a scene, and touch the edge of his cloak. Maybe that'll be enough. And it is to physically heal her. But let's see what happens next. It's amazing. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him, and so he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? (laughs) This was the moment. Uh Uh-oh. Jesus noted, noticed. My plan to sneak and leave may not work. Verse 31, you see the people crowding around you, the disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? The disciples are like, Jesus, it's a mosh pit. What do you mean who touched you? This guy, that guy, this girl, that girl. Everybody wants a piece of you, Jesus. But Jesus knew there was a special touch. And so get this, in the midst of a violently pressing crowd, Jesus keeps pressing to find the touch. It says, there, verse 32, Jesus kept looking around. That implies that this woman didn't want to be seen. Kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. Gosh, this woman's got to be a bag of emotions right now, right? I mean, there's hope and joy and excitement over the physical freedom and healing she's experiencing, but now she's trembling with fear. Was this the moment that I now get rebuked in front of everybody and my sense of value and identity gets even more shattered? Did I just make Jesus unclean, and will there be consequences? Twelve years of hearing, you're unclean, and you're going to contaminate anyone and everyone that you come into contact with. And this is where Jesus twists the story. Daughter, your faith 
has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. This was a value, identity, meaning, purpose, fulfillment healing. This is what she needed as much as physical healing. And he flipped the script and said, wait, hang on. Do you think you're going to make me unclean because you're unclean? The truth is, I'm clean. And I'm going to make you clean. (laughs) You, You think that your uncleanliness is going to contaminate me? No, my cleanliness is going to change and transform you from the inside out. Now she's healed and transformed and made new. And don't you see the beauty in that? That it doesn't matter how unclean or dirty we come to God because one touch, one drop of grace just removes all the dirt and mess. Man, we got to preach this better, this, this how we approach God, that we don't need to be all buttoned up and reciting a perfect confession, but just come. Just come to the one that can clean you. It doesn't care how you come, just come. And I love what Jesus does. He doesn't condemn this woman or say, wait your turn, I've got something else to do, right? This, is, this isn't a take a number situation like boars head meet at Publix. Or even worse, the DMV, where they shame you and rebuke you for just walking through the doors. Man, this isn't like soup Nazi in Seinfeld. (laughs) You just got to be so careful at everything. No soup for you. No, Jesus stops every single thing that he's doing to single out this woman. With the crowd around her, he's able to notice a single woman who touched, and he's able to flip the script and show her a new kind of DMV, a divine moment of value. That's what God does when he shows up, is he shows you how absolutely valuable you are. It's one thing to feel physically fine, and that's a great feeling. It's the one thing to have your whole emotional, mental, and relational world turned upside down in a moment. She got told by the God of the universe, you are valuable. And, and, and again, think of the context Jesus is on the way. He's doing important stuff. And, 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 and I think one of the most often overlooked traits of Jesus and his healing is simply the fact that he's available. That on his busy schedule, he'll show up for you. That there's nothing too big in this world that would stop him from giving you exactly what you need today. Nothing. Some of you just need to hear this gospel, that you are not an interruption to God ever. Amen. Ever. That's what boggles my mind. Like, God is the greatest multitasker in the world, right? What he shows this woman and what he shows you and me today is you are incredibly valuable, and I'll stop everything that I'm doing to spend time with you and to pour into you and to bring healing into your situation. He can have a million other things pressing in on him, but he's able to be with you right now. Wow. And that's good news because some of you may feel like that woman today, desperate. Maybe it is a physical issue and you've been praying for healing. You've been trying out things in this world and maybe you're frustrated. God can use doctors and medicine, but maybe it hasn't happened for you yet and maybe you're still not sure what's going on and it's frustrating and embarrassing and starting to eat at you from the inside and maybe you're starting to believe the lies and it's starting to not only affect who you are physically, but it's starting to affect the inside of who you are too. Maybe you've tried all the things of this world and still come up empty. Have you tried Jesus? truthfully, because Jesus loves you and he is available for you right now. And honestly, it would save you so much time, money, and energy if you'd quit trying anything and everybody else in this world and simply bring everything that you have to Jesus and let his healing and wholeness just wash over you. God uses things like medicine, surgery, doctors, diets, and stuff to physically heal, but sometimes that stuff can work on the inside too, but there are things that Jesus can do that there is nothing in this world can touch. Only he can restore value and identity to us, to those of us who've been beaten around by the ways of this world. And so think about, again, this woman had been hurting for 12 years, and she's healed now from all of it, physically, mentally, emotionally, psychologically. And then, it's like a throw-on at the end of this gospel reading, then Jesus went and he raised this 12-year-old girl that was laying on a bed, and he raised her from death back to life. In the category of miracles, I'm like, that's actually a bigger one. That's a bigger one. 
This woman for 12 years, she's been relationally, physically, mentally unhealthy. This woman that's 12 years old, dead, is physically, relationally, mentally, and emotionally dead. (laughs) That's a bigger one. And what happens? Jesus goes to her and brings her life. Like this is not a This is not a throwaway at the end. This is actually even more beautiful because there might be some of you that feel like that 12-year-old girl. Maybe you don't have faith. Maybe you stopped believing. Maybe it feels like you've been left for dead and you got no strength and endurance left to even come and approach Jesus to touch the edge of his cloak. And if that's you, don't miss this. When you don't have the strength to come to Jesus, Jesus has the strength to come to you. How cool is that? This woman could muster an ounce of strength. The girl had nothing. And yet, Jesus showed up. And that's the invitation. Jesus says, come to me. But when you can't, I'll come to you. Isn't that what Jesus is about? God who takes steps in the initiative in order to save and clean us from the inside out. And as I reflected on these 20 verses in the middle of Mark chapter 5, I started to see them for what they really are, which is honestly just a beautiful representation and microcosm of the entire rescue mission that Jesus came for. This is exactly what he did. Jesus ultimately came to establish his kingdom on this earth, and he would do it with a life and death matter, dying on a cross and raising from the dead to bring all the dead back to life. An impossible challenge. And yet along the way of this impossible, challenging, busy task, Sometimes people ran into him. And sometimes he would run into others. And oftentimes the ones that he would run into were the ones that were forgotten, cast aside, and thrown away. Think about this. On his grand mission to save the entire world, which by the way is you and me included in that. On this grand mission, what did he do? He found a few fishermen that that had failed school and the world labeled ordinary and said, welcome to the opportunity of a lifetime. Wow. He didn't have to do that. He found a wee little man hiding in a tree, someone that the world hated. He wasn't just a tax collector, he was a chief tax collector. This guy's high up in the IRS. Nobody likes the IRS. And he radically changed his heart. And little Zacchaeus would become a missionary. Did you know that? He found a Samaritan outcast woman and sat by a well and heard her stories of how she had been rejected by five men and the sixth one was like it. And Jesus said, I'm the seventh man and the number seven means completion and he brought completion to this woman by the well. Another one that's crazy, some manuscripts don't even include it because they think it's so scandalous, is when this woman was caught in an adulterous act and they were trying to trap Jesus, they take this woman from this adulterous act and throw her in the dirt next to Jesus. And the law said she should have been killed in that moment for what she did. And if you truly were to think about what's happening in this story, if if, if it hasn't come through that you can come to Christ dirty and unclean, think about this woman. She may have been stark naked on the floor. And rather than condemning her, what did Jesus do? He got down into the dirt. Because when mercy meets dirty, mercy wins every time. And he said, woman, I do not condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. Not only this, this one's the most mind-boggling to me. Like the 12-year-old girl on the table, there was a man that was left literally for dead. And Jesus would give him a life that counts and a hope that lasts in his last few breaths. Catch this. Even while Jesus was near the very end of his impossible rescue mission. Like, this is what he came to do. Like, at the climax, when he's hanging on a cross with the weight of every sin of every man and every woman of all time hanging on his shoulders, he found a criminal, a thief, a man that deserved to die. And in the brutality, in the excruciating moment that Jesus was going through, he had just a little bit of strength left to tell this man and single this man out and say, today you will be with me in paradise so that in that man's last few breaths he had hope 
seriously? At the very end, after the whole rescue mission that has been conceived before the very world, you would take time, Jesus, to do that? Who would Jesus not take time for? No one. And so the good news is you have a God who shows up. God who knows how to bring life to death, to physically heal, but spiritually brings a restoration and a healing on the inside that makes all the difference in this world. And I think we need to preach and teach more of that healing ministry. One that's maybe not as seen, but as unseen, that's happening on the inside, because what I'm seeing is a a world that's getting wrecked mentally and emotionally. Mental and emotional uh, health are as poor as they've ever been. Anxiety and depression are rising like never before. Relationships are getting harder and harder and more complicated to maintain. More people are being pulled to isolationism and individualism and finding loneliness. Never before has the restoration of value and identity and the inside healing been needed of Jesus than right now. And the good news, wherever you are on the journey, Jesus shows up. If you've got strength to come to him, come, touch the edge. If you don't, sit there, he'll come. So what do you need Jesus to do? I like the way Jeremiah says it. There's nothing too hard for my God. There is nothing too hard for my God. If you're watching online, you're going to type that in right now. There is nothing too hard for my God. Because the same God that put the stars in the sky formed you in the womb. The same God that came for a rescue grand mission of the entire world saved you in the midst of that. He's got too much going on for me. There's other people with more important things. No, 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 no. God's like the greatest multitasker in the world. He can hear your prayers and my prayers at the same time. He can, there's nothing that our God cannot do. With God, all things are possible. And so come to Jesus if you're able, and if you're not, he'll come to you. And here's where this gets interesting. Once Jesus has touched you and restored identity, the practical piece for us is now his Holy Spirit lives inside of you. And so just as he was available for this woman and this 12-year-old girl, he's available for you and available for me. And so the practical piece is once God has done a work in you, you then become available for others. And especially you reach out to the hurting, the poor, the broken, the lonely. That's what you do. Here's the truth in how to be successful in God's economy. Success comes when you combine your availability with God's ability. Really, what is the cross other than a collection of men and women that have been available at times? Not always perfect, but just keep showing up and keep being available because here's the truth. You don't have the ability. God does. He lives inside of you. All you got to do is show up. God will work far more through the available than the able because you can have all the ability in the world, but if you've never once made yourself available, nothing will happen because God works now through ordinary men and women. And that's a part of the great invitation that he invited the 12-year-old girl, the, tw- the bleeding woman for 12 years, the fisherman, Zacchaeus, the Samaritan woman. He invites all of us into this opportunity. And you see, like one of the great comforts I have in this chapter of life that we've had that I've been so grateful for, one of the great comforts that I have is just this beautiful reminder that God puts on me every now and then that God can do more in one second than I can do in a best effort attempt at a decade of ministry. So what does he ask me to do? Be available? Why does dad have a healing ministry for infertile couples? Because he's available? What do you need? Let's be available for one another. I want to be available for you to open up the word. The worship team is available to sing and use their gifts. We want to be available to serve you as you come in. We want to be available for the community to reach those that no one else is reaching so beautiful as God still shows up. And you see, by the way, when you remember that it's about God and not you, how that just takes the pressure off to perform and do your best. And I got to preach one of my best ones because I'm leaving soon. No, I don't. God, I just need you to show up. And if you want to use me, fine. But if you want to use call or rod or the choir or an usher or Sydney or a dream team, God, just show up in any of us. And let's see what God can do. And I've really been praying and believing that God wants to do some great healing today in this place right now. Right now. So the question is, what do you need? What do you need God to do? Are you hurting physically? Let's pray for healing. Are you 
believing the lies and labels of people in this world, some people that ought to even love you, that have said things about you that aren't true. God, just bring value. Restore identity. Are you a teenager that's going down a a broken road right now and just need to be brought back? Are you someone who is stuck in the throngs of addiction or a bad habit and you just can't shake those chains? Are you struggling in your marriage right now? Are you having a hard time just how to be a parent? You know how to handle screen time with kids? That's me, by the way. What do you need? We got a God who shows up. So we're going to worship, and then we're going to have communion, which, by the way, is just God showing up in a tangible way today, miraculously, mysteriously. And we're going to worship, and then we're going to pray. So I would ask you now, as we worship, to worship with what you have. So if life's good, and you've got all the strength in the world today, and you came in feeling good, then man, just worship God with every fiber of your being today. If you can barely muster an ounce of strength, muster that ounce. And if you're like so beaten up right now that all you can do is just sit and receive, then just sit and receive. And come to a God who will come to you first. He is here right now.